I haven't upgraded my daily use version of Blender since 4.0 was released almost a year ago, but that's about to change because Blender 4.3 is due for release on the 12th of November, and it's packed full of all sorts of really nice features that I'll want to use on a daily basis. So the first feature I want to talk about is something I never even mention normally in these videos, and that's the user interface. Blender's always had a nice system that allowed you to sort of split windows and create new windows, but the problem is it's always been very finicky. It's difficult to figure out exactly where you should put the cursor. A lot of the time you end up with windows that you don't want. So now the actual hitbox has been made a little bit bigger, which makes it easier to find. And then you can just grab out here and it will show you a preview line instead of splitting the window straight away. You can right click if you want to cancel that. But let's just say we want to see the side view of this character so we can split up and have a second window over here go for the side or the back view or underneath or whatever and let's say we wanted to move this window entirely somewhere else where we can just grab that now and move this over here and then move it back and that's not a problem it's not going to split the windows wheelie like it would have done before if i come out of full screen here what you can actually also do now is you can uh, grab one of these windows let's say this one and you can just completely undock it just by uh, grabbing and dropping it over the other side. So let's say you wanted to take the uh, outliner and move it onto a second monitor. You could do that really easily. Another nice little feature that I've noticed is uh, this scroll bar on the bottom of the timeline. If you shrank the timeline down too far, it would cover it. But now, as you can see, it actually disappears. So you can still access this while having... The, uh, the timeline as small as possible where it's not taking up a lot of space. So speaking of the user interface, we have another update that I've been wanting for a long time. If you have loads of textures, uh, loads of image textures in your blend file, it can be very hard to figure out which one is which, especially if you're like me and you don't tend to rename stuff very often. It's hard sometimes to find what you want. But now if you bring up your list of textures, you can just hover over them and it will actually show you a preview of which image it is. This works in the UV editing space and it also works in the shader editor as well. So if you want to change textures easily, you can do that. Another area that's had some much needed love is the sculpting panel. I'm not somebody who does a lot of sculpting, but lately I've been doing some characters such as this one. And it's always a very frustrating experience for me because I don't know the tools well enough to judge which one is which based off the little icons. But if we go over to the sculpting panel now and we take a look at this, you can see that the massive list of icons that we had down the side is now being replaced by this bottom bar over here. It's split up into different categories like paint and simulation, and you can actually decide which categories are going to go on the bottom in this little panel over here. Uh, it's all based on the asset library, so you can load in your own brushes and things if you want to as well. We can change the size of these so you can actually easily see which one of the brushes is which, which I like a lot. And what I also like is that you can actually enable the names on the bottom here and see which one is which specifically, which is, I think this is something that we should have had for a long time because I really hate the experience of scrolling through all these different ones. Now, this um, tool shelf sort of thing for the brushes has also been added to the grease pencil. If we go to grease pencil and add a new stroke into here, and then we change this to draw mode, we have the brushes on the bottom over here. Something I've noticed while we're on the topic of grease pencil, which is not an area of Blender I know well, but if we turn on the eraser here and you start to erase things, it now just kind of changes the transparency. Whereas before it would delete a whole segment, you can now kind of fade out the edges. If we go into the edit mode, these edges are still there. So you can still like select those parts and maybe turn on proportional editing and affect the line, but they won't show up in the render. Moving on from the UI stuff, we also have some really exciting things happening in the shader editor. If you look at the principal node, you'll notice that there's now a new drop down called diffuse. And if you open up, it has a slider called roughness. Now inside the principal uh, shader, we've always been able to change roughness, but that would only ever change the specular roughness, which is basically the sharp highlights that you get 
but it wouldn't change the diffuse roughness. If we take a look at the diffuse shader, you can see even though this has no specularity, it does still have some roughness to it, which basically just adds an extra amount of uh, light absorption into the algorithm. So now you can do that over here as well. If we take the metallic off, even if we have this really shiny, we can change the underlying amount of light that is reflected or absorbed in a diffused manner. Before we move on, I just want to say that the flash sale on my Gumroad courses comes to an end on November the 8th, that's next Friday. Right now you can save 20% on my new course, the Exterior Masterclass with the code LAUNCH, or you can save a massive 40% on the Interior Masterclass and the Essential Topology Guide with the code FLASH. Blender 4.3 also has some entirely new shaders included. If we do a search here for metallic, you can see that we have a new shader called Metallic BSDF. Now, technically, this doesn't have any features that you couldn't achieve with the principal shader, but in reality, it just makes those things a lot easier to achieve without having to mess around with lots of different complex node setups. So if we take a look at this, you can see, first of all, that it's not using plain white anymore. It's using this slightly cream color, which most people will know if you want a more realistic metal, you automatically kind of move the slider a little bit into this cream section. So it has all of the controls that you would normally expect a metallic shader to have, but it also has this edge tint. Certain metals, when looked at from a certain angle, will have a different tint to the light. And now you can actually replicate this and get much more realistic uh, metal materials. Now, this is the sort of easy to use version called F82 Tint, but you can turn it over onto this mode called Physical Conductor, which allows you to set the exact values for how you want the light to be interpreted when they hit the surface of these metal objects. This is not something that I'll be using, I imagine, because I don't understand it and I don't really want to learn it but it is there if you're the sort of person who likes playing with these types of very complex setups. I've long championed the idea that we should have more native noise textures built into Blender to use for procedural textures and also for geometry nodes. And we finally have one, it's called the Gabor texture. If we take a look at this uh, first output called value, you can see that it's by default set to 2D. I'm not sure why that is. I think it's maybe just because it's quite intense to calculate. So this makes it a smaller calculation, but we can change this over to 3D. And you see what this basically does is it creates this sort of rippled wave effect. Now, that's something that's going to have a lot of uses as it is, but you can change the frequency on this noise to get lots of different effects and the anisotrophy to really change things up. You can also grab this and change the direction really easily over here, which is a nice control to have. But if we change this to say phase, you can see that we get much different results. Uh, we can change the scale on this once again and the frequency, and it will give us all sorts of different effects. I love having new stuff like this put into Blender because it's something that I know for certain I will be using this when I'm creating materials in Blender. Lastly, we have this intensity output, which is kind of a similar thing to the last one, but it's more of like a gradient with an almost uh, Voronoi sort of cell effect to it. And once again, we have different controls for anisotrophy and frequency that give us a lot of different effects. In keeping with the theme of taking old Blender systems and improving them, we now have a new algorithm for performing UV unwraps. So if we press U here, we can't just hit unwrap anymore. We now have three different options. Uh, the original algorithm in Blender was angle based. And if we check this out, you can see that it gives us these tiny little fingers. Uh, if we actually turn the checker map on here, you can see that this is doing some really weird things. We have these huge white and black tiles over here, and we have really small ones over here. So you're gonna get a lot of stretching and it's gonna look very weird. That was upgraded to the conformal one, which gives us the, the giant middle finger. Um, and yeah, we have actually a worse problem here. We have these huge tiles on this finger, apart from this middle one, and it's not going to look very good. So now if we go U and minimum stretch, this will give us this. It might look a little bit weird, but we're definitely going to get a better result. The good thing about this is it has this iteration slider, and the more you bump this up, the more the algorithm will keep repeating the function. I think it goes all the way to 30. And if we run this 30 times, you can see that we get this very nice clean unwrap. All of these squares are basically the same size. All of the, uh, the arrows 
And I tend to find, especially with organic shapes and really strange shapes like this, it does a much better job. And finally, Blender has a new system for volume scatter. Now, if you watch any of my videos, you'll know that I love using volumetric fog and atmosphere. I use it in almost every render that I do. I really love the way that it looks. But up until now, we've only had one algorithm for producing volumes like this. But now we've been upgraded. We have not one, but five different algorithms. This one is the one that we've always had in Blender. This is the default. But we have these four new ones, and each one of them is designed to replicate a specific type of condition. So if you hover over them, it tells you what they do. This first one is made to replicate an underwater look, basically. So we can turn the density up on this, and it will look more like we're underwater. It's got various settings that you can play with. And the second one, I believe, is for space nebulas. Yeah, interstellar dust. So if you do a lot of space renders, that might come in handy. The third one, Rally, is basically just your regular um, atmosphere. If you were making an outdoor scene with mountains or something, this would be the most realistic one to use. And the final one is made for doing um, thick fog and clouds, basically. It's atmosphere that contains a lot of water. So you can play with the density here. And this probably isn't a very good scene to use as an example. But I've seen some renders using various different uh, solutions here, and they all look very good. Let me know in the comments below which one of these features you're most looking forward to, or if there's any other features in 3.4 that I've missed. Make sure you check out the links in the description where you can pick up any of my courses on sale until the 8th of November using the codes that are provided below.